Thank you so much for joining us for this week's uh, seminar. We have a special guest speaker today who's going to be introduced by um, Assistant Professor Dr. Kumi Smith. So Kumi, take it away. Thanks, Mark. Welcome everyone. Um, we're really honored today to have Bill Miller uh, give his talk. Um, Bill Miller is currently Senior Associate Dean for Research at uh, Ohio State University. Um, and before that, he chaired the Division of Epi at OSU. He's also the Editor-in-Chief at the Journal of Sexually Transmitted Disease, Diseases and the Associate Editor for Epidemiology. Um, so before he went to OSU five years ago, he was actually faculty in uh, medicine and epidemiology at UNC where I was lucky enough to have him as my PhD advisor. And uh, Bill Miller really, I realized, was the Swiss Army knife of uh, health science research. He's, he's a real leading expert in HIV prevention science. He's led a, a large number of studies, NIH funded largely, um, related to HIV in places like Malawi, Vietnam, Ukraine, China, let's just to name a few. Um, and he's a really gifted epi methods instructor. He's a talented writer. Uh, he literally has a PhD in neuroscience on top of his medical degree. He's a master baker, and uh, most of all, he's an amazing mentor. Um, folks, some folks on this call probably know that after this talk today, he's actually going to do two separate mentoring sessions with trainees in our division. So we're really um, grateful to not only learn from Bill, but also to have him um, take time and, and really um, share his knowledge and experience with us. So thanks so much, Bill. It's a real honor. Thanks, Kumi, for that very nice introduction. Um, let me share my screen here, make sure I get the right one. Great, so um, let me just leap into it and make sure this works. So uh, just really briefly, the funding I'm for the uh, studies I'm gonna talk about today are from um, NIAID, NIDA, NIMH, NICHD, and CDC. So, I'm going to talk a lot about descriptive epidemiology more so than, than sort of our traditional exposure outcome uh, causal epidemiology today. And, and part of that goes back to the London in the 1850s. Everyone knows about John Snow. But one of the things I want to highlight is this third bullet here, which is communicating with the government and legislature on matters connected with the prevention of epidemic diseases. And much of what I'm going to talk today goes back to that sort of fundamental purpose of, of epidemiology. Along the way, I'm going to talk about some of the twists and turns my uh, career has taken and, and sort of how I've gotten to this place today. And I'm, I'm going to emphasize a little bit serendipity and seizing chances when they arrive. Um, you just don't know quite when, when things are going to um, present themselves. Um, and then I'm also sort of going to emphasize that the traditional methods that we use um, can really go hand in hand with policy. And what I mean by that is often in our, in our teaching programs, we really emphasize the methods and we forget about how that relates to policy. And, and as epidemiologists, I really don't want us to, to sort of forget about the, the policy side. So as Kumi said, I, I I did get an MD PhD and my PhD was actually in, in neuroscience. And one of the lessons for the more early career people here is, is you can start off in one direction and, and take a real left turn and, and move on to something else and still have a, a, a reasonable career. Um, in the upper uh, right here is, is some work I did while I was a, a resident at the University of Maryland in Chile, where I convinced people to swallow these tablets with a string inside and the string unwinds. And after a few hours, you yank it back out to be able to look for salmonella typhi in the, in the small intestine. After uh, Maryland, I went on to, to do my uh, ID fellowship at, at Duke because I was able to go to Tanzania for a year and um, to, do, to do global health basically before global health was called global health. And that was a huge shift. You know, I had done this neuroscience PhD. I've been doing some laboratory work and, um, and I felt like <clears throat> I, I just needed to do something different. And I forgot to mention this, this little uh, uh, picture over in the lower left is actually from my, my PhD dissertation 
showing neuronal, neuronal activity in the basal ganglia of, of monkeys with, uh, with Parkinson's disease. Anyway, after my sort of wandering around in Africa for a couple of years at, at, at Duke, um, <clears throat> I realized that I had no idea how to do the kind of research that I wanted to do. And fortunately, I had a, a role model in, in someone who was a couple of years ahead of me who had gone from Duke to UNC, which is a really long nine mile trek. And um, when I got to UNC, I suddenly realized what I had been meant to do all along, which was to become an epidemiologist. And, and I just was thrilled to be here, to be there after um, wandering around, trying to figure out what my life was supposed to be for so many years. At UNC, I um, was fortunate to have two years of support from something called the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. Um, this is me as a clinical scholar visiting Donna Shalala, who is then the Department of Health and Human Services Director or Secretary. And um, along the way, while I was a RWJ clinical scholar, um, they had a site visit. And for those of you that have ever worked with RWJ, you know that policy is one of their uh, most important features of, of the work that they, they do. And they had expectations that those of us in the clinical scholars would be doing policy work. So um, during the site visit, they asked me, so what are the policy implications of your work? And at the time I was doing some work with chlamydial infection. And I was like, um, oh, I'm not really a policy kind of guy, and which, just kind of blew their heads off. And um, fortunately, they let me stay in the program despite my, my naivete. And, and I finished and, and I, I never actually ever really thought of myself of, as a policy person until recently when I looked back over my career and realized that all along I'd been doing things that were policy related. And as I was preparing for this talk, I, I said, something like that to my wife. And, and her response was basically, when your work focuses on the people that you care about, it will have policy implications. And that's really true. The, if your work relates to people in the community that you care about, that you, you have a passion for the work that you're doing, that's gonna lead to, have, to having policy implications. So, while I was in the RWJ program, I did uh, two big um, two studies, one of which was working with um, uh, chlamydia screening in chlamydia and gonorrhea screening actually at, a, um, at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. And the other was a, a, a paper that I worked on that was solely taking the methods that I'd been learning and applying it to screening for chlamydial infection essentially the very simple um, notion that performance of a test, in this case of screening criteria, will vary depending on the prevalence in the population. And that instead of having one national cutoff that everyone uses, um, you would have to vary that. And that was something that I was presenting to the CDC as a, as a fellow and it was just a real simple-minded methods thing, um, but it had a lot of traction. At this point in time, while I was a, a fellow, I met Irving Hoffman, who um, is going to come back throughout this. Irving is a, a PA with an MPH, and he ran the global health program at, at UNC. And one of the themes of my talk today is just find the people that you like to work with and keep working with them. So let's talk a little bit about sex. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these here, but I uh, just wanna say that the UK in general and Canada do a much better job of promoting uh, sexual health. So throughout the talk, I'm gonna give little uh, sort of statements and, and research questions and, and work our way through it. So one of the first things I, I started doing was basically in, in the space of clinical or healthcare epidemiology um, and had to do with new diagnostic tests. And often they're believed to be better than their predecessor, predecessors, which means that you don't have a real uh, gold standard per se. So how should they be evaluated? 
And in this, it, the reason why this is related to sex is I got into this because of new tests for chlamydial infection at the time. So while I was a clinical scholar, I was a volunteer for Family Health International, which is now called FHI 360. And I, I had a, um, an office that was literally in a, in a broom closet. Um, I, it was about four by six feet with enough room for, for a desk and a whole bunch of brooms. And one day Ward Cates, um, who was the president of FHI and a, and a leader at CDC before going to, to FHI, threw this paper on my desk and said, what do you think about this? And it was a paper that was written by a biostatistician about um, chlamydia, new chlamydia tests. And I read the paper, gave Ward some feedback, but I recognized that no one was gonna act on it because it was written for people that weren't the microbiologist type people that, that was really the target of the paper. And so I decided to, to essentially rewrite a paper, translating it in, into English instead of biostatistics speak. And, and I published that paper. And um, this is the paper that I published, Bias and Discrep Analysis When Two Wrongs Don't Make a Right. And that decision to sort of translate the paper and write a new one has been responsible for a huge proportion of my career, um, including things like giving statements at the FDA, a, a couple of JAMA papers, et cetera, all arose out of that, uh, that taking the initiative to write a paper that made sense um, and, and getting it out there. In fact, um, one of the things I was asked to do as a, as a first year faculty member was write an editorial for uh, clinical infectious diseases, which is a significant journal in our field. And it was a point counterpoint between myself, who was a first year faculty member and Julius Schachter. And Julius Schachter was the editor in chief of STDs which was the main journal in my field. He'd been that since 1989, so at least 10 years at the time. And um, just a force of nature. He was a, a, a big man and um, very influential. Uh, unfortunately, he just died a few months ago from, from COVID. But by, I was scared to death. Like, you know, he could, he could mess with my career if he had wanted to. Um, and, and I was explicitly saying that he was wrong. Um, but there's a way to say that people are wrong that doesn't irritate them. And, and that's what I tried to do. I just tried to explain and, and accept the, where he was coming from and do it in a, a, a positive way. And as a result, when over, we engaged throughout our, my, through, through the next several years, and when he retired from being the editor in chief in 2015, he asked me to take over uh, that role. So all the way back from that broom closet to, to 2015, just so many doors open from that, that decision to write that one, that one paper. I also um, had an opportunity to be part of the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, um, <clears throat> which was is also referred to as Ad, Ad Health, got included as their sort of STD and diagnostic test expert. And that led to this uh, study of Ad Health um, shown here where uh, we just showed that chlamydia was very common in, in young adults. And um, these are my, my children. And the reason why they were here is because this newspaper arrived um, at my, uh, my house and I, I pointed out that my name was in the paper and my daughter who was in first grade at the time wanted to take it for show and tell to, to talk, tell her class about chlamydial infection. Um, that was something we decided uh, not to share with, with, with her class at that point. So another piece of chlamydia work that's much more recent is related to surveillance. Um, chlamydia is the most common bacterial STD. It's often asymptomatic, um, but it causes pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, and ectopic pregnancy. And in the 1990s, the CDC had implemented screening program in the US. 
but assessing how well that has worked has been a real challenge. Um, so the question is, measuring the burden of disease and impact of screening is really difficult because we have the diagnostic tests have changed over time, the population being assessed has changed over time, and how do you incorporate that into your assessments? And the truth is the CDC doesn't make any attempt to, um, to make those uh, assessments normally. So with my, uh, uh, well, really, she did all the work. I just sort of said, yes, that looks great. Um, with my doctoral student, student M Emily Lerner, um, she did two things related to chlamydia prevalence and incidence um, working with the CDC. So the first was looking at uh, trends over time. So uh, in Job Corps, and Job Corps is a national um, program for typically dis disadvantaged youth. Um, the screening, the, the group of people that enroll in Job Corps has remained fairly steady over time. So it gives a pretty good sample of, of the population over, over time. And the CDC had done three separate assessments of um, the trend of chlamydia over time in Job Corps. They'd never put them together and they'd never really uh, accounted for changes in diagnostic tests which began in the early 90s with a pretty non-specific and not very sensitive test, and it moved to quite good sensitive and specific tests um, by, the early, by the early 2000s. So Emily uh, took this information and essentially accounted for the changes in test performance over time and showed that in Job Corps, after an initial pretty steady decline, there was, there was a, a, a little bit of an increase in prevalence um, in, the, in the 2000s. She then went on, again, working with the CDC to think about the surveillance rates that are being reported by the CDC about uh, chlamydial infection. And this is a challenging problem if you think about it. So this next series of slides is, is basically just showing um, uh, what we have, what we want to measure, what, what we have and what we measure versus what we want to measure. So when we think about surveillance case rates, we have a case rate denominator, which is usually the at-risk population, in this case of women for chlamydial infection. And then you have an, uh, a population that actually has chlamydia, and that's the population that we're trying to, to reach. But only some of the women are screened for chlamydia. And some of those are diagnosed with chlamydia. And you'll note that that, that doesn't overlap perfectly. And that's because the tests aren't perfect. And then of those that are diagnosed, some of them are reported to be cases. Not every case is reported. And so you end up with a case rate numerator that is those reported cases over the case rate denominator, which is not what you're trying to measure, which is the orange over the white. Instead, you're the dark blue over the white. So to fix that, you're trying to, to get a better estimate of, of uh, that orange section, the counterfactual incidence rate numerator, we called it. And we can work backwards to, to sort of back our way out to get our, our best estimate. So the first thing we have to think about is reporting and how much under-reporting is there. Then we can think about test performance and of those that were tested, how much did we, um, did we either over-report from false positives or under-report from false negatives? And then we can also think about that the proportion of women that are screened of those that should be, and that's what's called coverage. So if we can correct for all three of those, we could um, get a better estimate of what the rate actually is. And so when we do that, um, this is what we get. So the dotted line at the bottom is the reported case rate. And the green line at the top, and yes, that's a big difference, is the counterfactual incidence rate calculated after you account for reporting bias and changes due to um, reporting bias changes due to diagnostic chest changes in coverage. And 
so Emily did a, a further analysis to look at what of these was the most significant. And the blue line here above the dotted line is corrected for reporting bias only. So reporting only makes a little bit of a difference. The um, test performance makes a little bit more of a difference, but most of the difference is actually related to coverage, meaning what proportion of the population is being screened in any given year. And it's much bigger in the beginning because the coverage of chlamydia screening was much lower through the um, uh, early 2000s, and it's been pretty steady since about 2006 or seven. So another element of this sort of policy informing work is working directly with, with state governments. So the last series we were working with the CDC, here we're working with, with the state of North Carolina. Um, and in this case, the um, states often don't have as much money as, as you would like for them to be able to respond to things. Um, sometimes they don't have the expertise. And so we work with them to try and um, basically help them target the funds that they do have to be effective for STD and, and HIV prevention. But before I go on, I have to give a shout out to PUBH3351, People, Places, and Diseases, and Ruby Wynn, um, who mentioned that most of the undergraduates from that class were being uh, forced to listen to me. So at least they get a little shout out. So one of my um, earlier doctoral students was um, Ian Gessink, who had a master's degree in, in geography. And one of the, over the course of my career, spatial epidemiology has become much more common and much more important. And I would say that, that one, the most important lesson in, in my world is to make sure you work with a geographer and or spatial statisticians and don't try to figure it all out yourself. Um, when we were working with the state of North Carolina, um, one of their first things was, we're happy to share the data. We'd love for you to do some mapping, but privacy is a big issue. And um, many people know about geocoding. Ge geocoding is simply putting an address on a map. You open up Google, um, Google Maps and type in your address and that's geocoding. Geomasking is the process where you modify that point perturb it in some way so that you can't figure out where the actual address is. So this is my home in, in Columbus and, and geomasking would be some activity that would perturb this somewhere else in, in the area. Just enough that it, you can't figure out it was me, um, but uh, <clears throat> not enough to disturb the analyses that you're going to do. So one way to do it is, is random perturbation where you just simply um, pick a, uh, a direction randomly and a distance randomly. The problem with that is in theory, a person could be put back right in the same spot. And particularly with conditions where there are very few uh, cases that can be a problem. So we came up with an alternative method which we call the donut method. Um, these are top pot donuts, which are from Seattle, they're basically the best donuts I've ever had, and I like donuts a lot. So the donut method works like this. Basically, you perturb some distance that's within the donut, but not within the donut hole. So no one can ever be placed on their same um, spots. And this, was, this work was done by two graduate students, Ben Allshouse and Kristen Hampton. I should uh, update that. She's now a, a PhD. She was my last uh, PhD at, at UNC. And we took it one step further to make sure that no one ever was perturbed outside of their census tract or census block, whichever unit you're using. So it works like this. This is Orange County, which is where Chapel Hill is. These are the simulated cases at addresses you draw a donut around each of them. Um, you'll note that some of them aren't complete. So this is what the eaten donut part, um, for example, up there in the upper left. Um, then you perturb 
and um, find a new random point, and you can um, see just basically how much they were perturbed. And this method has been used quite a bit by many people across the country subsequently, um, and it was sufficient for us and it was important for us because it allowed us to, to begin a whole bunch of uh, mapping studies that we did um, with the state of, of North Carolina. One of those uh, studies that we did was related to um, the scale and the method uh, used. Um, and this work was done by Veronica Escamilla, who was a, a postdoc with me. She was a, a geography PhD and she brought in um, great skills for, for the whole spatial epi space. The, the issue here is, is basically when people in public health use um, maps to describe things, they often don't take into account um, is essentially the denominator and what denominator has been chosen. Um, so we looked at, uh, I'm gonna show you work using local Moran's eye and the impact that your choice of the denominator has on your results. So local Moran's eye basically is a way to, to identify um, clusters or, or high impact units such as a census tract. Um, and it takes into account the rates in the um, adjoining areas. So we looked at three example analyses using Mecklenburg County at, for one, using the Piedmont region for the second and using the whole state of North Carolina for the third. And the Mecklenburg County is where Charlotte is. And basically what we're doing in this analysis is looking for clusters or what are called core areas of sexually transmitted infections, meaning high um, transmission areas. And this is the, um, just the syphilis rates in Mecklenburg County. And you can see that some areas, the dark gray areas are, have higher rates than those that are in white and the metropolitan area is, is shown there in the dotted black line. And the importance of the denominator is shown here. So if you're looking for a cluster and you're thinking about how am I gonna intervene, you have to think about, well, what's my comparison? And that's why I was referring to as the denominator before. Your com if your comparison is, is the whole state, you find a much, much larger area that's considered a cluster. But if you're only considering the county, it's a much smaller and more defined area. And similarly, you get slightly different results if you use uh, a different method. That's kind of going to be obvious, right, to anyone that, that, that does that. If you, if you do one method, you'll get one answer, and you might get a slightly different one not necessarily that it'll mean it'll make a big difference, but a slightly different one using another, another method. And we extended um, some of this work or in parallel did work with um, partner notification and especially doing some sexual network analyses related to partner notification. So you have a reported case and, and then you go and you try and um, find their sexual partners. This is obviously exactly the same principle as contact tracing for, for COVID-19. I'll come back to that at the very end, very briefly. And what we did was use these data to construct sexual networks to help us understand um, why an, an outbreak occurred. So this work was done by Irene Doherty and this was early in the 2000s. And in, in 2001, the US rate for syphilis was 2.2 cases per 100,000 person years. In contrast, in these two counties, Robertson and Columbus County in, in North Carolina, um, the rate was 72 and 74.9. It doesn't take any statistics to, to understand that that's substantially higher than the US national rate. So we looked at um, several counties that were involved. Um, I wanna highlight the blue one, which is Cumberland County, which is where Fort Bragg was, which is where there's this, Fort Bragg is. And, and there's essentially an endemic, reasonably high level of syphilis there all the time. And the other color counties were part of this outbreak. 
So this is Cumberland County. This is where Fort Bragg is. And this is what you would normally see in any place that has reasonable sort of endemic levels of transmission. This is about the extent of connectedness that you see. You have one larger component there in the upper right that's sort of connected in a chain with a, a few stellate patterns and, and then a few. And then you also see a whole bunch of dyads, um, ones where you can't find connections over time. And just keep these two images in your mind for a second. This one that's a little bit like this, you know, a few connections, and this one where it's all dyads, and then contrast to that to the counties that were involved. This is clearly different, and it doesn't take a network analyst to realize that, that you're gonna have a lot more syphilis in a county where connections look like this or this than it did in, in those Cumberland County um, uh, components. So this density of connections really easily explains why you would have such an explosion of syphilis over a short time in, in these couple of counties. And I want you to just pause for a second and think about these last few slides in the context of COVID. If we were just talking about people's connections, uh, how much exposure they had to people. It's really easy to see that if it looks like this, we're gonna have a much bigger problem than if it looks like this. And this is what the whole social distancing is about, which is largely related to the work that people have done in, in other infectious diseases, as well as respiratory viruses for decades. We've extended this work more recently um, to look at um, HIV in clusters in, in North Carolina. This is work um, by Ann Dennis and Dana Pasquale. Dana was one of my um, PhD students. And here we've looked at both the sexual networks from partner notification, as well as the phylogenetics from the viruses that are isolated from those people that are positive. And what we've seen is, is that there's definitely pretty good overlap, but not as much overlap as you might ex expect, um, seeing that there's genetic connections in places where there's clearly missing data in the sexual networks. And that's predictable because you, you can only find um, some proportion of the sexual partners, which leads us to partner services and trying to find partners to uh, engage uh, them in HIV and STD care. So the question is what kinds of partner services are effective and who is reached through those partner services. So this work was done in, uh, in Malawi uh, where UNC has had a, a, a lar large program for many, many years done by Lillian Brown. And basically someone comes into the STD clinic, they get tested for HIV, and then they were randomized to either the standard of care, which is still the standard of care in many, many places in the world, which is you hand them a card and tell them to go give this card to your partner, or you involve a provider in some way, either immediately where the provider um, just contacts the partners or in what's called contract referral, meaning that they, they have the card and they can give it to their partner, but if the partner doesn't come within a certain period of time, then the provider notifies them. And as you might expect, if you involve a provider in some way, you get about twice as many people coming in as you do um, just by handing them a card. And that's what this Kaplan-Meier plot shows. The gray line at the bottom is passive referral. The black line at the top is uh, provider referral and the dashed line is contract referral. And you have a little delay in contract because the contract waits for a week before, before it um, is initiated and, and then it ultimately cat, catches up. And one of the things that we did along with this was a cost effectiveness analysis to show that it was a cost effective procedure. We expanded this to this partner services idea to couples in an antenatal clinic. Um, most of the time uh, in the Malawian setting, only the women come to the antenatal clinic, um, but if they're found to be HIV, uh, infected, then we invoke this partner services for their partners. And again, showed that if you involve um, some form of a, a provider, 
um, that you get more males participating. And by, by using um, these two studies in, in Sub-Saharan Africa were some of the first to do partner services in, in Africa. We've been, we've been doing similar things in the United States for a long time, but it hadn't been done in other parts of the world as much, particularly in less resource settings. And these studies were two of the key uh, pieces of evidence that led to the World Health Organization rec recommending that <clears throat> it be a standard of care for people that are getting HIV testing. We extended this work more recently um, in a study we referred to as INO with the idea that basically we're gonna try to find people who are unaware of being HIV infected through partner services. And this was work done by um, uh, Sarah Rutstein, who was um, one of my uh, NIHF award trainees. She was in health policy rather than epidemiology. And Kathy Lancaster was my PhD student. She is now at OSU with us. And, and Jane Chen just finished her PhD recently. And in our, the, the key difference with this study is that we added in, um, we looked at it from a clinic perspective as opposed to an individual perspective and asked the question, if you invoke partner services in a busy active clinic, and you include uh, acute HIV infection, which is the earliest stage of uh, uh, HIV, will that, will that work um, you know, beyond a, a trial uh, perspective? And, and essentially the answer is yes, we still got about twice as many people referred and we found twice as many new cases of, of HIV, but um, it wasn't, quite as effective as it had been in, in previous trials. And, and part of that is I, I'm quite sure that it was just in incorporating it into the clinic as a, as a routine standard procedure. And the last example of, of sex that I'm gonna use here before I move on to drugs really briefly is um, a, 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 another example of just simple thinking about what the issue is. So in the early uh, 2000s, a, a new measure was proposed and rapidly adopted and promoted, but the measure had big flaws and those hadn't been discussed. And that measure was called community viral load. It was basically a way of taking the mean of viral loads of all people that were in care and using that as a measure of um, how well a community was doing. And from the first presentation in 2009, um, it was immediately taken up in, in new uh, requests for ap applications from the NIH and et cetera. So it expanded really quickly. And the NIH put out RFAs like within weeks of this new measure uh, being presented. Um, but the problem was that it was actually a kind of a bad idea. And um, Kumi was one of the folks that, that helped with this work along with Kim Powers, um, basically showing that, that it was a, um, there was significant problems with selection bias, that uh, even if it worked perf perfectly, it still had problems and no one took into account sexual networks or, or ecological fallacy. And so we published this paper um, shortly thereafter, just make, making the case that if you're gonna use this, you have to do it much more thoughtfully than it had been done before. And unfortunately, it's a much less common measure than it was in, in its heyday. So moving on to drugs, um, I was minding my own business in my office one day in, in the early 2000s and, and Mike Cohen, who is my boss walked in. And for those of you that know Mike, Mike is a, is a, a big personality. And he said, I have a proposition for you. And he said, do you wanna work in Russia? And I said, being a sort of naive early career assistant professor, I said, sure. And he get, handed me this project looking at pregnant women um, who present at delivery and they needed most pregnant people, women who inject drugs. And they hadn't been using their, they hadn't been coming for antenatal care. So they didn't get tested for HIV, which meant that, that the babies had a, significant risk for HIV infection. 
So <clears throat> um, I took on this project and we pretty quickly um, were able to implement screening for the women at delivery, treatment for the women and, and, um, and delivery. And, and for any of you who have ever read Flat Stanley, Flat Stanley has made some good journeys with me in my, in my earlier career. <clears throat> so that first work in Russia then led to bigger questions um, about people who inject drugs, particularly those with HIV infection and trying to prevent HIV infection um, uh, in them. In general, people who inject drugs don't access HIV care, and, um, but they could benefit from, from treatment. So I was fortunate to, to lead uh, this study, HPTN 074, which was this, I'm not even gonna read the title. This is the longest title of any study I've ever been affiliated with. And we worked in Ukraine, Vietnam, and Indonesia. We enrolled people who inject drugs and we gave them a fairly simple intervention, which was basically systems navigation, which means helping them make appointments, helping them figure out where to go for HIV care and those kinds of things. And essentially a, a two session counseling to just help them maneuver um, their substance use and HIV care. And they could have two more booster sessions if they chose. And the outcomes were antiretroviral therapy, um, uh, medication for opioid use disorder and mortality. And there's Irving again, who has been here throughout um, most of these studies. So we randomized them to either that intervention or standard of care, followed up for 12 to 24 months. And we also enrolled partners and looked at zero conversion. I'm not gonna talk about partners uh, because the rates of uh, incident HIV were very small, but they were all in the uh, standard of care uh, group, any cases that occurred. But with this simple intervention, just two psychosocial counseling sessions and the brief systems navigation, um, we dramatically increased uh, antiretroviral therapy. We increased those that were uh, suppressed, meaning that their HIV RNA was not uh, at a high level. And we also um, decreased death. We lowered mortality in the intervention group. And this was a, a somewhat unexpected, um, but, but marked result. And as a result, we've been able to take this, this study, and now we have a much larger one uh, going on in Vietnam with 42 clinics across the country. Um, in a cluster randomized trial, uh, looking at different ways to implement that intervention, what we call SNAP, uh, across, uh, across the country. And finally, uh, finishing up in Ohio, most of, my, uh, most of my opioid work had been done, all of my opioid work had been done globally, but as the uh, opioid use and Christ, the opioid crisis took off. Um, Ohio was one of the places it was substantially hit, particularly in, in rural areas in Ohio. So we have designed a study that's ongoing that's looking at how to engage um, people in rural parts of Ohio. Along the way, we've done some community organization, um, bringing uh, winter clothing to, to people who are injecting drugs and their families. Um, and the study, itself is being done in, in three, three parts, um, all in Appalachian, Ohio, down here in the South, um, in six counties. It has both qualitative and quantitative elements. Um, we do a social network analysis of, of agencies working in those areas. And, and now we're actually in the um, implementation intervention stage. But what we found is that stigma is, is probably the biggest obstacle to anything. And it's uh, not just about substance use, it's also about stigma against harm reduction and uh, medications for opioid use disorder. There's also limited collaboration, um, just this schism between abstinence-minded people and those who are 
in favor of harm reduction and just generally limited options and a lot of burnout. Now I had to throw this in here um, because sex, drugs, and rock and roll is what you would normally expect to hear. Um, this was a, 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 a in, this was in, in Indonesia, Indonesia, and Indonesia is a largely Muslim country and we had to do karaoke because the leader in Indonesia loved karaoke. And um, it was completely non-alcohol fed karaoke and I'll just leave it at that. So finally, um, finishing up, in the last year, um, I've been doing COVID-19 work. And COVID-19 is neither sex nor drugs. And, um, but that's what an infectious diseases epidemiologist does in, in 2020 and 2021. So my work has included helping the Ohio Department of Health with their initial surveillance plan, um, giving them some guidance on contact tracing, which is essentially the same kinds of procedures as partner services that I was talking about earlier. I uh, helped design and implement a, a study of mask use in schools and, and uh, whether or not uh, uh, those that were exposed needed to be in quarantine. And at OSU, I've been involved in, in the COVID response at a, at a on a daily basis, basically. But the other thing I've been doing for the last year is um, answering media questions more than any other point in my career, including being included in a cartoon on 538.com. So finishing up, um, reducing stigma is probably one of the biggest issues for any of the work related to STIs, HIV, or substance use. It just is still present. It's a huge obstacle, particularly for STIs and, and substance use, I would say. Um, in order to, to have policy impact, you have to ask questions that have policy relevance. And I go back to what my wife said the other day. If you if you have passion for your work and you and you want to make a difference for the people you're working with, your questions will have policy re relevance. In order to do that though, you have to build relationships with government officials and address problems that are of concern to them. And even problems that they may have in giving you the data like the donut geomasking that we, we developed simply because that was a concern of, of theirs. Um, you have to take their work into account. A lot of times uh, researchers come in with these grand ideas and it just wreaks havoc with the work that the government folks have to do on a, on a regular basis. Um, so, uh, and also respect their expertise. We have a tendency to be a bit arrogant about what we can do and, and how we do it. You have to expect, expect frustration and disappointment along with the successes you may have great ideas and propose them and, and people go off in, in different directions. And, and that's okay, that's just the way it is. You have to just, then the next time they ask, you have to start from that place rather than with any I told you so's or anything like that. Um, be prepared when opportunities present themselves. It's hard to know sometimes when something is, is, a, is a big, uh, is gonna be a good thing for your career. But if I hadn't, uh, sort of looked at that paper in that broom closet way back in the beginning, or said yes when Mike Cohen walked into my office when I was minding my own business. I would have lost out on on big parts of my career that have that have that have made a difference. I think. Then finally, know your own strengths and weaknesses. I'm I'm an absolutely terrible project manager, um, but I'm pretty good at writing the grants and thinking about what to do in the beginning. I'm pretty good at the end. In the middle, I'm, I'm useless. So I have to have people around me that, that, that can do it. And, um, and you just have to understand yourself. And finally, find your people. One of my fundamental rules is, is work with people you like. Um, it's really difficult to work with people that, that you don't get along with. So thank you very much. These are some of my um, students from, from UNC and um, I'm, be happy to answer answer questions.
Thanks so much, Bill. That was really great. I felt like we just took a, a, a world tour of um, many different fields and places. So thanks for that. Um, we'll move on to the Q&As, but I'll let you know that uh, while you were talking, there was a raging debate going on about donuts, um, mostly <laughs> goaded by um, Dr. Rich McElhose, who ha apparently has very strong opinions on this. I'm sure he'll, he'll speak up about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, to debate about donuts. <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that to you, Rich, to, to pop your question in the chat if you want to start fights. Um, so uh, I can kind of, um, you, you, I think you can see them too, right, Bill, the questions? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I'll let you scan those over while I ask you my first question, which is, who is Flat Stanley? I've never heard of this, this character. <laughs> Flat Stanley is a children's book, um, and Flat, Flat Stanley gets taken in suitcases all over the world. And so it, it's a common assignment if like over a summer break for children to, to you know, take it on vacation or whatever. Um, huh. So my kids, Flat Stanleys, went to London and to St. Petersburg. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Uh, I'm gonna, there's one here about the social network analysis. Um, so can you describe the agency social network analysis that you did in the Ohio opioid study? So basically that, was within each county, we did uh, something called the partner survey, which is essentially an, an analysis that looks at who each agency is connected to. So like the sheriff's office and the health department and the mental health uh, board and those sorts of agencies, as well as some of the um, nonprofit agencies. And you ask them, you know, who they work with, who they don't work with, um, who they respect and, and that sort of thing. And, and the key elements that we saw there was just a, a huge lack of trust for almost everyone except the health department. Um, it, was, it was really quite striking and particularly the law enforcement agencies. Um, there's, I, let me, I'm gonna skip the donut ones. Um, so are there particular strategies you would recommend for reducing stigma? Um, so the, the stigma varies and there's obviously lots of different kinds of, of stigma. So the within our o Ohio opioid study, um, we are currently doing a few things. So we're, we're helping and, and these are gonna be obviously be incremental. But one of the things we've done is just simply write an op-ed um, or sponsor an op-ed really, which was written by someone in recovery um, and trying to get uh, people that are champions for the cause is really important, especially in some of the more rural communities. And, and those champions can be people that are in recovery or they can be leaders in the community who have been affected and are willing to speak out. And, and there's lots of different elements and um, it's, it's really a, a function of which type of stigma you're, um, you're trying to address. In the STI space, it's, it's simply about talking about it, frankly, and, and trying to shift our uh, dialogue really from STI and a disease model to a sexual health model where STIs are just one piece of that at, at, from, the, from the whole, right? And um, one of my colleagues has written a, a, a wonderful book about STIs and, and stigma um, that I can uh, recommend uh, to anyone that's interested. Um, what policy related skills are important for health geographers to you to use? I'm just sort of picking them random, randomly. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I, I mean, for health geographers, first of all, uh, I work with, I've worked with a lot of health geographers and they're actually often quite good about the policy side. I think they have a, a, a little better understanding than, uh, than some of the epidemiologists actually. Um, and the key is really, just understanding your data, understanding what, what it means and, and not over interpreting it, and then being able to present it, communicate it to the people that you're working with. And communication is a, is a big part, whether that's written or oral, um, we have to learn to be able to speak at a level that, that people will understand what we're saying. 
um, and, and that's a, a ch challenge. I'm going to answer Rich McElhouse's question about, uh, I didn't know you were from Ohio, Rich. Um, anyway, how was our team received in Southeast Ohio? Um, Southeast uh, Ohio is part of Appalachia. So the first thing we had to learn was how to pronounce it correctly in their mind. Um, and because if you say Appalachia, they'll know immediately that you're not from the area and that you haven't done your homework. Um, the, the second is the, we were met with some skepticism um, at first. A lot of the work we did over the first year was just listening to people, frankly, and, and that made a huge difference, actually. Um, um, if you come in thinking that you have the answers, uh, it doesn't work very well, but coming in and, and essentially going on a listening tour uh, made, made a big difference. Um, let me see. All right. You can be choosy, Bill. There's, there's more and more coming in. <laughs> I know. Um, there was one about COVID stigma, and and um, I would so it, it, there's definitely COVID stigma in across the country in, in multiple forms. COVID stigma among people that got it, uh, people being sort of shamed for having gotten it when you know people think, well, if you wore your mask and you stayed home, you wouldn't get it. Well, that's not entirely true. There's quite a few people that have a lot of difficulty figuring out where, where it came from. Plus, you don't know the circumstances. Uh, a lot of people have had to engage in healthcare, either as a patient or as a, a provider. Um, there's lots of reasons why, why I get it. I think that the whole COVID response has been so mismanaged from the very start that um, all I can really hope for in that space is that we do a better job next time. Um, I, I really, really hope that that's the case. Um, someone asked about the book I mentioned. If uh, just look up INA, INA Park, and STD, and you'll you'll find the book. I don't remember the title off the top of my off the top of my head. Um, uh, let me scroll. Yeah, so uh, Ruby has asked, um, can you explain to us how social networking systems are studied? How do you develop those networks and uh, how do you interpret those figures? What do they tell us? So there's, um, there's so much to say about networks. Um, so the network diagrams that I showed about the uh, syphilis outbreak in, in North Carolina, those are um, sexual networks each element is called a component. And basically what you're looking for in those is the degree of connectivity between people. The more someone's connected for an infectious disease, the more likely transmission is, is going to happen. Um, and, and that's true whether it's COVID or a sexually transmitted disease or, or something else. Those data are difficult to collect and, and they actually present some really interesting methodological problems because there's so much missing data. So from the time that that work was done to until now, the thing that's really changed is, is how much people find partners through the internet and, and apps and that sort of thing. And there's just many more anonymous partnerships, which makes it harder to make those linkages. Um, uh, although, there's quite a bit of work actually working with some of the, at least for partner services, working with some of the apps like, like Grindr as an example, where you actually send your notification um, through, through the app that someone has been exposed. Um, that's a whole course into it, unto itself, really, um, how, you, how you really work with those things. I think I'm at 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock your time. So you I could are. keep going on, but um, probably shouldn't. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Bill. Obviously, you've um, piqued a lot of interest in, in our division. So um, please come back in person at some point. And then um, a reminder to all of our trainees that we've got the two um, mentoring sessions where, where I think some questions that have popped up about career advice will be a great place to um, follow up with Bill on that.
So um, thank you so much, Bill. Mark, anything you wanted to add? Not sure if Mark can hear me, but yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. sorry, I was I was thinking about next week and a quick comment that next week we're actually going to have a seminar on the results of the COVID um, experiments from the Well Living Lab, and um, I strongly encourage people to attend because the the results are very very important for the transmission of of SARS CoV two, and we'll hear about that next week. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks all.